record and then I will screen share. All right. So here we go. Uh, nod of your head if you can see this. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, whiskey toothpaste. What? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I would get any toothbrushing done, but uh, my breath would smell delightful like whiskey. Uh, anyway, we're looking at a lot of things here. Perspective, theory, and method. And sociology really is everything, right? I mean, I don't even know this meme might be more famous than Michael Jackson at this point, right? <laughs> like, de depending on how it's used in a current thing. Uh, Fozzie Bear, um, the, me fishing. I guess my dad took that picture. That's us on the Fox River. Anyway, we are going to be considering an awful lot this semester. So if you say, what does sociology have to do with it? I would say everything, right? Um, but of course, I'm a sociologist. So here's how we start. And I'd like us to start every single class sort of session. And that's with asking questions. Be curious and ask questions. That is really what I'm going for all semester long. So we'll start off every single chapter with a bunch of questions. Uh, and these are pretty broad questions right now. Why do you believe and behave the way you do? <laughs> Eric, is that a broad enough question? Um, but these are things that we're considering, right? Why do other people believe and behave differently from you? And judging by the responses, I said describe society in one word, judging by those responses, we, we do feel differently about some things in this culture, right? Um, or as a global culture. What are the consequences to the answers of those questions? Why do you like the things you do? Um, how did you make the friends that you have? Uh, how do you see the world? Um, how do others around you see the world? And then really, because we're talking about just about everything here with sociology, you could ask anything. Like, like these are all important things to consider. Um, but some of these things, like, why do you like the things you do? I'm looking right here. I already showed you the class, totally embarrassing myself. I have no less than 20 action figures, toys, right? Action figures just makes them sound cool. I have 20 dolls within my reach at any one moment. What about that, right? I saw a great meme today and it said, uh, what was it? It was like, uh, when I tell the ladies that I make six figures a month or get six figures a month, and then I had a picture of six action figures underneath it, like Star Wars, Star Wars toys. Like, what's that about? How did you get into the things that you got into? Do you fish or hunt? Like, how did that happen? Who took you out there for the first time? Do you have a gender role that doesn't like line up with like society's prescribed gender roles? How did that come about? Anyway, all of these questions we'll ask and look at this semester. All right, so I do not have this on top hat because I just kind of want you to look at this. Got a little bit from group A and a little bit here from group B. So I want you to take a look at this. I'm gonna stop the share for a minute. Stop the share. I'm gonna stop the share. Why is that burned into my head over the last two months? Anyway, um, I'm gonna stop the share and you tell me, uh, which one do you identify with more? Which group? Do you remember what those groups look like? Should I show them again? I am going to show you one more time. Which group do you identify more with? Group A or group B? And here's really the most important question. Group, what is going on there? Is that a gumball machine? Good God. Anyway, um, look, I think everybody's like BBB. Okay, forget about that. I'm, I'm not asking you to type in a B or an A right now. That's hilarious though. Um, you tell me, because I want to know why. We're, I think we're in a bumper sticker culture, right? I don't like Obama. Go Trump. I don't care. That's not important to me, because most of the people are like, beep, beep, see you later. I want to know why. So I've got A's here. I've got B's here. It's an even mix, but those groups are very different. So tell me, why did you choose group A or group B when I say who do you identify more with? Go ahead. I'll explain why I chose group B. Awesome. I felt like group A felt too boxy for me. Like it was very like you're this way or you're not. I don't know. That's just kind of how I perceived it. 
Absolutely. And group B was more like eclectic. And I feel like that's kind of more me. <laughs> so that's why I chose group B. Uh, are you sure that you're an eclectic person? I'm just asking you this because of your background right now. Well, this is a dorm <laughs> wall. I didn't paint it. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm not playing. responsible. Uh, no, that's good. Okay, so you're a little more eclectic. The others look maybe a little rigid. Who else? Who would you identify with there? Go ahead, uh, Lori. Um, so for me, I identified with group A because, well, to me, it seemed like it was smaller groups, more academic focused kind of like that's the energy it gave off. So more like I'm an introvert and I'm studying mathematics and I'm not a party person. I like live in my dorm doing my schoolwork and stuff like that. <laughs> and so that's why I kind of gravitated that way. Awesome, all, all excellent reasons. Okay, great. Um, I think many of those reasons might, buy, might be why my son Storm, my 15 year old Calc, Calc 3 guy in 10th grade, I think he might choose those for those reasons too. Uh, it's not like he can't get down, but that's just maybe not his thing so much. What do you think? Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Um, I said I was kind of both now that I think about it. Um, just because, I don't know, I mainly stay in my room and study, and that's what group A seems like to me, just very like homebody. But I'm also an extrovert, so I like to go have fun, and I like to be out. I don't necessarily like to party, but I like to be out and about and have some fun. Be social. Awesome. Well, there's lots of different ways to party. All right. Uh, who else? Group A or Group B? I'll screenshot them one last time here. <laughs> there's so many reasons that my students pick for this. I love it. Go ahead. I'll stop talking. Go ahead. Uh, I feel I, like, I chose, oh, sorry. Oh, you go. No, you could go. <laughs> go ahead, Casey. Okay, I guess I'm going. Um, so uh, I related kind of how Lindsay said, because at first I just said B. And then she had said, I feel like I'm a mixture of both of like the academia and also like the social aspect of it. Like, I just want to be out with people. Um, but initially I just chose B because I'm like, dang, all these people are extroverts, like giving them fire outfits that they were wearing. <laughs> um, just like more like some, like someone who like wasn't afraid to, yeah. Like who, who who's going to wear that outfit if you aren't confident in it? <laughs> um, so I, I personally thought that it was just like, okay, these people are confident with what they're wearing. I feel confident in myself. That's, that's why I chose people. Awesome. Um, I agree with you. I don't know many people that are going to wear that outfit if they are not fully confident in, in, um, in that outfit that they chose. For sure. Good. Uh, that's tour de fat, obviously. Like, not, it's so weird right now in ways. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's all weird. But to not be able to gather whether that is in a weird freakish parade that kind of defines Fort Collins, you know, because I know when I showed those pictures to my mom and I'm like, this is part of what defines where I live <laughs> she was years ago. And she's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, anyway. Okay, good. Uh, maybe one or two more people and then we'll move on. Uh, I see online because I resonate with the Mormon faith. Yeah, I'm assuming, assuming though I'm not for sure that the guys with the bikes and the helmets and the ties are not just good dressers that appreciate bike safety. They are probably also connected, yeah, with Mormonism in a way, absolutely. More of a bow tie type of guy, so B. I'm more of a bow tie gumball machine kind of guy, really, than B. Um, what else? Anybody else? Then we'll move on. I was going to uh, say, yeah. oh, sorry. No, <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, so I just said B because I feel like, um, not necessarily like the introverted versus introvert thing, but I feel like, B just felt like a more accepting kind of group and like a lot of like festivals and things like that it's not so much about being out there and being crazy but more about expressing yourself and being welcoming to other people who want to express themselves not saying that group A wouldn't be but I feel like I would feel more free to do what I feel is comfortable for me in group B versus feeling like I have to conform in group A. Good and and uh Excellent answer. I was really thinking about that, though, when you were saying that I'm looking at the two groups and I'm like, there is an interesting way, although group A seems similarly visual, at, like similarly visually at first, they are expressing themselves with different color ties, right? They each have different bikes, you know, and stuff. So once one seems really uniform, maybe in different helmets until I like look closer or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, good expression, individuality. Okay, well, we'll move on, but um, 
excellent. And this is, neither one is right or wrong, but this is how we're starting to look at, right, the world, like in a kind of encompassing kind of way. I mean, I've, I've never put on a purple wig, uh, a pair of Speedos and a gumball machine and worn just that out in public before, but I'm also not saying I haven't worn some interesting outfits in my day. So, right, different, uh, different perspective and different approach here. Uh, love biking around campus, sober, of course, of course. Uh, all right, let's move on to sociology. So what is sociology? Uh, kind of everything, really. Like I said, the systematic study of human society. Okay. So again, these are, this is a social science, right? Um, we're not doing guesswork. Um, it's scientific because we're making observations. We're looking at relations and groups and societies, um, how those relationships influence our behavior because really it's not just what we think we think or what we think someone else thinks who we think we are when we think what we think and then we say, it's also about behavior, right? Some people are like, put your money where your mouth is. How about put your behavior where your mouth is? And then let's see where we go from there, right? So how societies develop and change over time. And I think if anybody has spent any time in the United States culture, we know that that's not technically just forward. One, two steps forward, one, two, three, four, five steps back, a little cha-cha-cha forward, couple to the side, to the side. That being said, society's never stagnant, okay? Culture always keeps changing, and that is whether people like it or not, right? Um, and oftentimes, and we could do a show of hands, though I won't here, I could say, who loves change? Uh, or I could even say it less like that. And you know, half the hands might go up and half of the people are like, keep things just about the same for me, that'd be good. Um, so we study that, right? But no matter what, and we do hear that, uh, the only constant is change. But in sociology as well, um, societies always change and evolve. Just think about that. Like five years ago is different than right now. 10 years ago, Reel it all the way back to when I was 10 years old in 1983. Oh, what a glorious, glorious time. Uh, fluorescent colors and G.I. Joe and I don't know. My kids love the 80s, but they didn't have to live through the 80s. Uh, anyway, so right, like culture's different. And how different are the 80s from like the 50s? Um, and then if we were to compare the 1950s and 2020, wow, right? So doesn't always change quickly but it changes. Uh, most people don't get a shave like this anymore. That requires an awful lot of trust. I would say that if you've got a straight razor, you gotta be watching yourself. All right, so sociology adheres to the principles of social embeddedness, okay? That's the idea um, that all of these things that we experience, the economy and political arenas um, and other forms of human behavior are fundamentally shaped by our relationships. Like I said before with the reformatting, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we try and clean that up in, uh, in future ones. I'm assuming somebody didn't have the most current version of it, uh, but that's all right, you understand what it means, okay? And when you were talking about epistemology and really an overall piece, the word I was looking for at that moment was the sociological perspective. That's what we're trying to do here all semester long is gain a sociological perspective. Is that Kanye? Kanye. No, is that, who is it? Is that Pete? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, seeing general patterns in the behavior of particular individuals. That means that we're looking at big patterns and we're looking up close at small things, right? The macro of society and the micro. I know that people like, you know, I do what I want. I want to be a unique individual. I don't know if there is a person in the world that thinks that more than me. I'm an only child. Uh, oh, I just heard everybody go, oh, no. I'm an only child. I'm a Leo. Uh, like my skills are playing in a band and talking to hundreds of people at once. I am the individual. But I do things every single day based on what society tells me. And so do most of us, I think pretty much all of us, right? So, um, you know, these general categories in which we fall that sort of shape our life experiences, gay, straight, goth, trans, child, adult, gamer, jock, brother, uh, sister, only child, whatever that might be, um, 
there are relationships that we're going to study this semester that are up close and personal. And then there's the big picture. So, you know, at this point, you think of all these categories, just like a handful of categories. Just think about these categories and, and then think about how your life experiences are shaped by these categories, some of which you fall into, some of which society decided, some of which you embrace as part of your identity. And, you know, we all have a pretty <clears throat> large list of those groups that we belong, subcultures and countercultures. And we'll talk about all that. Definitely. Kind of. Yes. Um, if I could just backtrack really quickly. Yep. Um, you said that there's no guesswork in sociology, but one no, of no, the there's, theories. There's lots of guesswork. Okay. Lots. But what I'm saying is when you train yourself to look through multiple paradigms or multiple theoretical perspectives, then you eliminate some of that guesswork because you're looking at direct systematic observation. We're always going to have questions that are unanswered. Um, that's why we do research, right? Yeah, so is what you're saying, it's scientific in the way that we make observations and ask questions, or is it scientific in like, there are specific ways we do things? Both, absolutely, because we're gonna look at, as sociologists, I mean, okay, and this is a, like next chapter, but we have to measure and observe all sorts of things, right? Well, some of that is going to be quantitatively. X number of people, uh, a teenager is X number of years old. Teenage pregnancy is defined as, here are these people in certain numbers of socioeconomic categories, which are all quantitative categories based on data, right? right? And then I'm going to also ask you to look at that. And then I'm going to say, how do you measure love? I mean, so as a sociologist, yeah, some of the stuff is very scientific and some of it requires us to have a more qualitative approach to it. Um, but yeah, I would never say that in a social science, there's no guesswork. We're human beings. <laughs> that means that a certain percentage of people in this class, if I say, here's how to get an A plus in this class, do A, B, and C. There are certain people that are programmed to be like, mm-mm. I'm, I'm achieving my grade in a different way, right? Like, you know, like human beings are not always going to do just what we think they're going to do. And that's why, you know, it seems really, really, really exciting and interesting for me to study that or for people in general to study sociology. Okay, so let's look since we've got a, I think I'll look at Top Hat for the first time. And what uh, one word that describes society uh, in the United States right now. So one word that describes society in the United States right now, let me read down this list to you um, in real time. Uh, oh, and never be sorry about asking a question. That's why we have class. Otherwise, I'd just be like, go watch my videos and I'll make my money. No, <laughs> I want us to process these ideas. Um, you know, not just roll around in piles of teacher cash. They're very tiny piles, a lot of change, but still, it's great. Woohoo, just like Scrooge McDuck. Okay, uh, here are our lists. Actually, that sounds really dirty and gross. Um, okay, number one is 28 people typed the word uh, divided as the very, I'm not trying to pretend to be surprised, but that's a lot of agreement. I have never, in the eight years or so that I've been doing this and asking a class, never seen that many people answer when you're just pulling one word out of the universe. Like this, there's a lot of answers on this list, but 23 people for one word, interesting. Okay, chaotic, five, chaos, three, polarized, separated, turbulent, corrupt, anxious. Okay, 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 it's, it's a Monday, it's a Monday, let's get something good on this list. Here we go, here we go, uh, healing, there we go. Messy, hopeful, here we go. Unbalanced, divided, lost, stratified, disunity, hectic, complicated, beastly. Troubled, diverse, conflicted, damaged, skeptical, sad, stubborn, egocentric, bizarre, cultivated, isolated. This is almost like, like lyrics now. I'm just going to roll down this list. Uh, uh, terrified, split, flustered, accountability, unfamiliar. Wow. The question was, one word that describes our society in the United States right now as polled in top hat by our class. There's our 90 answers. Um, so tell me. Uh, why? Why did you answer? What did you answer? Or, or, and then I'm going to, I'll have you make a step 
like, here you go. There's, I said you weren't sociologist officially yet, but make an observation. So you can either observe on like the general nature of the list, tell us, or what was your word and why did you pick it? Um, so I said skeptical um, because I think a lot of people are kind of concerned about how we're going to do any kind of recovery. And we're kind of not ready to trust whatever has been sent out yet. Okay, good. Skeptical. Who else? What did you answer? Or we also could be an observation on the, on the total list. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Carmen. Um, I said lost because right now, um, just kind of like Lindsay said, we're not really sure what to do. This is kind of like specifically with COVID and like the whole election and stuff. I think everybody like everybody I've talked to or seen or like anybody in the news is just kind of lost. Like they don't know what they're doing or like someone they supported is like not in office anymore. They, you know, don't know what to do. They can't see family. It's like a whole new way of life. So I think everybody's kind of lost. <laughs> Yep, it's intense, isn't it? Uh, to have to reinvent everything that you do, just like that. Um, thankfully, I think human beings are up to the task. Culturally, we have some challenges, right? We're not New Zealand. That, that just maybe reported its first case of COVID in the last couple months. Oh, we've got a case. Yeah, right? This is the United States. We're diff dealing with different cultural um variables. And we're going to talk about that, right? Uh, so for sure, there's a lot of upheaval right now. Maybe the word is lost. Who else? What did you, uh, what word did you choose or what observations do you have? I chose the word divided. And I chose that because I feel like in America, everything is very much like political and everything's made to be very political. I lived in England when the COVID thing all first started. And when I was there, everyone seemed to have a, like a collective agreement that it was real, that like, that you need to social distance, that there was masks. And when I came here, I back here, I was like surprised with how much like, it was just so political and how much there was like discourse in between some of the basic things that other countries seem to not have as much of a problem. Yeah, um, culture is so cultures are so very different, right? Leadership matters. Um, science matters. I think it's safe to say that science took a hit. Isn't that a weird thing to say? Science over the past few years took a downturn. What? Science can't take a downturn. It's science. You didn't shut off gravity for four or eight or 10 years. Um, but yes, the approach culturally very, very different. And that's not to say that that can't be done in this culture. That would be silly to think that it hasn't. I mean, ration your food. If you've seen the World War II ration your food posters, they're so great. Or um, a draft or just a collective sense of what we all do. We have achieved that in the past. I'm old enough to have seen it within my lifetime. It's been challenging in this culture at best over the last while uh, and long while. I'm not just rewinding four years, I'm saying, you know, in the 1970s, Republicans and Democrats thought the environment was an important issue, right? And it wasn't just either or. So I think it's become polarized, uh, absolutely. And I love the take of your comparison of the two different cultures, how they got to it. Um, I think that you'll see uh, with this new administration, putting that out there, that we are very programmable. And uh, we will talk about that this semester. Um, you know, the advertising rule of 10, if you hear it enough, it will make it so. That drives the entire global economy, and it's quite true. When you hear mask up enough coming from the right places, we'll see a, a change in that. All right. Um, so who else? Uh, what word did you pick? Or we haven't had any observations of the total list yet. I'll say something about the, like, total list. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the words were negative, which says a lot about how our, at least our group, like the class feels about America as a whole. It's rather negative instead of like, you want to believe in your country, right? You want to have like faith, not like to an extent of nationalism where you're like mm -hmm. so American, but you should want, you should think positively on your nation and have like belief in our system. But the fact of the matter is we don't. <laughs> not right now. 
Yep. Um, I think the list is about as uh, unstable or potentially negative um, as I've ever seen it. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that uh, that all of you individuals are, are feeling negative. But if I'm asking a broader question about our culture, I think that uh, that seems to be the rhetoric and, and the news headline of the day, right? The last week or so or two weeks or so is division and unity and how does that happen and what does that look like and um and and not just on a political realm but in people's communities big ones like fort collins or small ones like where my parents live and sort of rural illinois where you're surrounded by cornfields um, which is another reason my parents have never seen a tour de fat before also no bike lanes in my hometown of illinois we'll get to that um all right uh what word did you choose and why or i'll move on or observ observations about this list. Do you think this list is going to calm down? Is it because it's been so tumultuous? Uh, I know somebody just said the election, but this is like February almost, and that was in November, like the very beginning of November. Why am I even still talking about this? Um, that's obviously a rhetorical question. What do you think? Um, do people feel positively, even if their take on culture right now is like unstable? What do you think? I agree that it's overall pretty negative. I think it has to do somewhat with our society and the way that like news broadcasts things. We see a lot of the negative as opposed to the positive things that are happening around the world. And I think that's um, especially right now because obviously we have a new president and there were a lot of things happening with that. Um, but I think that's probably why even if in our personal lives, things are balanced and somewhat okay. Um, <laughs> overall, like we see a lot of <laughs> bad things in the news and people post that and all that. Right. Good. Good answer. And let's be real. We're like two or three weeks from an actual insurrection that took place in our national capital. I mean, how can we not mention this if we're talking about instability? That hasn't happened in 200 years uh, or in a long, long, long time. So I would say um, with no extra, extra added drama, a global pandemic, insurrection at the Capitol, police officers murdered with American flags. What? Um, yeah, I would say that likely um, people feel that things are unstable and, and, and uncertain and a bit negative. That being said, um, I think that there's a lot of reason to be uh, very excited and positive, not only for this class, but about our culture and global culture together. So, all right, let's... Uh, Take a look back. Any, any, anybody else, anything to add to this list? Okay, good. Let me head back here to the screen share. And, okay. All right. So uh, this is one of the ways that we cultivate the sociological perspective. And that is this relationship sort of between personal troubles or or personal challenges and public issues, right? So where biography and history intersect or where what's going on in the news cycle intersects with the individual, whatever that might be. So, uh, you know, an unhappy couple is that example of that personal trouble thing. But of course, there's probably some connection to the bigger picture. Let's look at the national divorce rate, right? If we say and profess that there's something called the sanctity of marriage, right? Then your uh, success rate has got to be like, like, like a uh, test worthy, 80, 90%, no, 50%. Okay, okay, okay. Well, anyway, then why is that, right? So sociologists look at that, you know, and we make those connections. What might that, what, why might that be? What, uh, what does toxic masculinity have to do, do with the national divorce rate? You know, um, how is toxic masculinity connected to the male gender or people who identify with the male gender? How does toxic masculinity come from when people who identify as the female gender raise male children? I mean, there's a lot to look at when we're looking at something like that. So how do we connect those dots and connect those issues? Okay. All right. Um, person loses his or her job. And then we look at unemployment trends or even immigration issues, right? If we look at immigration historically, we know one thing is true. 
we hear about immigration, we hear about people taking jobs, and then, and, and that all of that right there happens in an economic downturn. Economy downturns, people are going to steal my jobs, economy goes good, ghost town quiet for a while, economy downturn, those people are going to steal my jobs. That's why before I said, when we look at sociology, we got to have the timeline, okay? Past, now-ish, and, and future. And, and the reason is so that we can connect these issues. I mean, if some of these human being or these cultural things for us keep happening over and over and over again, that's not unknown to us as social scientists. We can predict those things, right? We can understand how society might react to them and try and get in front of that even. So one of the things that we look at here is the sociological imagination. This is what I am trying to get you to cultivate, seeing that relationship between the individual and the larger society. And I don't ask always a ton of questions on exams, but C. Wright Mills, you should know that that's associated with the sociological imagination, okay? Pretty basic, but I also think important. And again, that's the relationship between individual lives and the larger social forces that shape them. Why? And I mentioned the 80s and somebody's like, the 80s is awesome. Why was there a lot of people, <clears throat> were there a lot of people, excuse me, in the 80s wearing colored tube socks and fluorescent outfits? I mean, that does, doesn't have to do with the individual waking up and be like, you know what I'm going to put on this morning? A completely fluorescent uh, jazzercise outfit. No, <laughs> that comes from these larger society or social forces that shape us. Today, why have I got to have an Apple computer? Why have I got to have a certain kind of phone? Why have I got to have a certain kind of phone? Is it just because you're like, I have to have this phone? Um, there's a relationship, right? Between the big picture and the smaller picture. So many of our problems or successes are not necessarily unique, but the result of these larger social trends. So personal problems transformed into public issues, we examine that. Um, using the sociological imagination helps people understand their society and how it affects their lives. Right? how it affects their behavior or what you experience in this life. I mean, the larger social forces that were shaping the country 100 years ago, like I said, very different in ways than right now. Some of them overlapping still, very much the same, um, but they change. But I did sort of elude to, right? that uh, that might not be your choice, right? I mean, human behavior is not as individualistic as we may think, you know? I mean, what, like, eat, just think of something like walking around campus, like six or seven years ago, remember those boots that were like Lord of the Rings adventuring boots that everybody was wearing? They were super popular and they went up to your knees and like, it's like a fashion trend or what happened? Like, I remember this, what happened when sweatpants went from being just baggy all over to super tapered? <laughs> Did you just decide one day, you know what? I'm gonna buy a pair of tapered, no, flat brims, baseball caps to flat brims. Like, is that your choice? Or was that the product of these larger forces? So we're gonna be looking up that at, at those, the power that society has to do that. And also, we've got to give up that idea that people just decide to do something, right? You know, social control is a real thing. Social control is society's attempts to uh, regulate our thoughts or behavior. And it's not conspiratorial. It could be as simple, like I said, as Charmin. Gotta have Charmin, gotta have Charmin, gotta have Charmin, gotta have Charmin. By the 10th time you've heard it, you're like, I gotta buy Charmin when I'm at the store, I'm gonna chafe. That is not all your decision necessarily. So larger forces at work there. And then the question becomes, are we free? And I'm not going to dive fully down that philosophical road, but I will say this. Think about it yourself. Are we free? How free are we? How much power do we have as individuals? Free to do what? Power in which situations, right? Oh, here we go. For some reason, this, just the look on his face and everything, encapsulates college. I think that's, it's, it's just the John Belushi thing here. It's for some reason, it's not about whether you party or not. It's just life coming at you like that at that time, <laughs> right? So why did you choose to attend college? This is the part where I would walk around the class and I would actually 
get in your space. I would walk up the stairs. I would walk around. I would walk down. So like, why did you choose? And then of course the question is how many people or out of however many hundred people, right? Why did you choose college? How many people out of a hundred uh, attend college around the world? Let me get back to Top Hat. Um, and this is actually a right or wrong question. Like a lot of times I'm just asking for your sociological opinion. So out of a hundred and you answer, we had 92 responses. Um, <clears throat> five out of a hundred in the world. How many people out of a hundred attend college? Five out of a hundred, 34 people said yes. 10 out of a hundred, 24 people, 25 out of a hundred, 17 of you said yes. And 50 out of a hundred, only 50 out of a hundred. Um, I guess that's more, more, uh, three of you. So the answer is five out of a hundred. And if you watch that lecture, maybe you already kind of snuck a peek at that or, or something, but what do you think? Like one, did, did that surprise you? I mean, one of the things that it speaks to that we're going to be examining all semester long is privilege, right? Like what's privilege look like here and then in another country and then in another place and in another place. So it's all right. A matter at times of perspective. But considering that only five out of every hundred people attend college around the world, those of us in this class, even if you don't have a lot of privilege, we are, we, we are experiencing this, right? Which is comparatively a pretty unique thing. So the question to you, and I am asking you this question, and it could range like you had no choice to, I had nothing else to do, but why did you attend college? Both my parents were teachers. So there was no choice like to attend college or not attend college. It was like, you have to go to college. So I was like, cool, how many universities can I visit my senior year so that I can skip as many days as possible of my senior year? <laughs> no, 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 wait. no, that's not at all. Was, that wasn't my approach. Okay, it was my approach, but I didn't have a choice. So it was gonna happen really. Um, some people, you might be the first person in your family to go. And so instead of it being like two teachers in the family and the whole family went to school, you still didn't have a choice because you're the first one that was going to go or whatever. So why, why are you attending college? If so few people across the world are attending. Why are you attending? The profession I want to go to necessary. Both my parents went and loved it, wanted me to have the experience. All right. Give me the option to fall back in my degree if what I want to do falls through. That's a lot of falling, but you got this. All right. Um, go ahead. Instead of typing, uh, why are you attending college, uh, Lori? Just because I saw your hand. Okay, yeah. So um, for me, I'm a theater major. Like I'm getting a math minor, but I'm also a theater major. And that's something that people are just like, well, why are you going to school? And it's because getting a degree, even if it's in theater, opens up a lot more doors for me than if I just decided to immediately start and go audition. You know, like. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. You, you've, I mean, there's a way to do it. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. If you like playing music and you just got a band together last year, you can't start like sending your stuff around to people just to listen to it. It'll wind up in the garbage. You have to know the difference between solicited and unsolicited material. So whatever that might be, right? For whatever profession that is, gives you a leg up on, okay? Equine science is major, uh, major want to run a ranch. You're like, why not just get hands-on experience? Yeah, obviously, because there's a lot, a lot more to it than that, good. Why else are you attending college as I flip through four or five pages of folks? What do you think? Um, I'm going to college right now because um, I feel like I have a duty to like, because I am so privileged as to be able to go to college and stuff. I feel like I'm definitely the type of person, like I'm a mixture of the, what we were talking about earlier, group A and group B. I'm very individualistic, but I also, see my duty as being part of a cog in this working machine so I want to do my best to make society a better place so that way like people who like don't have as much as like I do can also benefit from that if that makes sense it does absolutely yeah um that's you're speaking in, in some ways of interconnectedness you know and the connectivity of our culture and maybe right now we're not experiencing as much connectivity or or patriotism or whatever would drive us to in the past have all sort of unified around something simple like putting a diaper on your face for five seconds when you're out in public right but i digress all right what do you think why else did you go to college so yep uh, anybody really go ahead um so the reason why i'm going to college is because um 
my parents weren't college people. One of them didn't even finish their degree and the other one got a degree, but then like never used it. It was like a degree in like art, like drawing. Um, and they didn't want me to go because they don't really value college and like we're, we're very poor. Like we don't have a lot of money, but like I got enough scholarships and grants that I was able to go. And like, I just like, like I want to be able to like make enough money that I can like support them and like get them like a real house and like, just like, I don't know, like support myself. Cause like, that's like a huge thing. Like being able to like financially support myself and like not rely on other people. Awesome. That, that is a huge thing. That's, and that's, uh, that's very cool. Good, good motivation. Who else? Well, I'm going to college because for kind of two reasons, like one, my dad was like dirt poor when he was a kid, like they ate food that they like hunted, like they were not very rich. <laughs> so he worked really hard to get to a point where he could afford to send me and my sister to college. And so I feel like it's kind of, you know, I, I have to fulfill that for them. It's kind of like my duty as a daughter, I feel like. And then also I've learned from my parents, like you get a lot of connections in college. And I mean, who you know is very important in a world where like we're super social and you can get a lot of opportunities just on who you know. So that's kind of like two reasons. Awesome. Anybody else? I'll go. Um, I decided to go to college because I plan on in the future um, to go to law school and I can't be a lawyer unless I go to college. So yeah, basically that's really the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> Direct line, A plus B, right? Good. Um, and and uh, for the other response, you're correct. Uh, you know, pulling a, pulling a grade is one thing. Pulling contacts and people you've met and, and educated people and people that can open doors for you, that is, that is a big part of what this experience um, is all about for sure. Uh, absolutely, good. Uh, one more. Um, I personally felt like I needed to go to college because I'm preparing to be a vet. Um, luckily I also really like college, so it works out. <laughs> yeah. The couple, like the couple doctor things that were, yeah, you know, I'm going to be a doctor. Yeah. Gotta go to college. Yeah. And thankfully, right. Thankfully. Cause because that wasn't that way. Always. You just be like, yeah, I need a, are you a vet? Well, I've got a knife. <laughs> Can you take a tooth out? Sure, I'm a dentist. Um, hooray for training <laughs> and really important things. So think of all these answers, right? You know, like college is so fun. I'm really sad to graduate this semester. Yeah, um, it's all different reasons. And within that, we're a very small percentage of sort of everybody that gets to experience this. Does anyone feel like college is very pressured? Uh, in high school, and that's why many students are undeclared. It's interesting, yeah, um, I would say one of the things, and not just in response to that, but the idea that you graduate earlier and earlier and earlier, and then you get out of college at 22 and you're supposed to know what to do with your life, I'm gonna say as somebody that's 47, my own personal advice is, I don't think you should be expected to know at 18 or 19 what you're gonna do for the rest of your life, nor do I think that that's very realistic. Um, so I think part of the function for many people in college might be to figure that out. Why some people are like, I know what I wanna do. I mean, I've got a 15 year old, he loves math, he knows math, he loves toys, he wants to use his math degree creatively to work at Hasbro and, and, and I think he's gonna do it. My other guy, I have no idea, no idea. He's, he's like, yeah, 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 uh-huh, yeah, yeah, right? So anyway, um, it's, a, it's a good time to, to, to take time to figure that out, really. But there's so many here that I love. Thank you for my high school co-op uh, program. We go learn about what we wanted to, make sure we like it. Yep, jazz hands, societal pressure. That's right, that's right. Give me one of those, another one of these. Was I in show choir in high school 30 years ago? probably not but you never know i was in a fraternity in college and 90 percent of you just went to yourselves what that guy's a frat guy i saw the looks on your face i saw Bra i saw Braden. Braden was like straight up like what yeah, yeah 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 anyway uh theta chi what fraternity theta chi so 
there is a Theta Chi uh, chapter on campus. Something tells me that they're a lot more studious than we were at our college. But that's because at Luther College, they pushed the fraternities underground. So people still partied like fraternities, but they didn't have to do any of the like social things that are important, that are important, like helping your community. So yeah, the college's uh, answer to that was subverted by human beings, which is often the case and why we study sociology. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see. What does that say? I could see on the keg stand. Oh, hmm. uh, it's interesting because when I was in a fraternity, instead of throwing ping pong balls for an hour to drink a beer, we just stood in a line and slammed beers and then lined back up and stood in the line. Now, it was a lot simpler. You didn't need ping pong balls. Not that anybody slams beers or treats alcohol in inappropriate way. Okay, we do. We have a ridiculous, horrible relationship, too many alcohol uh, related deaths um, in college. And we'll look at that. We're gonna look at the war on drugs in this country. We're gonna look at so many things uh, this semester. I'm excited about it. All right, let me go back to a screen share. And just a few more minutes here. Let's keep going. Um, that, yeah, the Theta Chi's on campus actually gave me a free t-shirt and I went and supported them for their Halloween thing fundraiser last year. So there you go. All right. Uh, so agency and structure, two things that are very important in sociology. Have a line on these. These will likely be on the test. They're basic things that I think are important besides. So agency, the ability of individuals and groups to exercise free will. Sorry, that's hidden behind the picture there to exercise free will and make social change rather on a small or large scale. Okay, so that's really, really important, right? Um, I mean, if you have to walk around with signs on it that says, I am a man, I am a human being, likely society is not recognizing that. And collective behavior and collective action amongst individuals is something important in sociology. So what is your ability to make change as an individual on campus, with people in your community and maybe then in the, the bigger picture, right? Um, yeah, and structure, patterned social arrangements that have an effect on agency. So like you could kind of see here that our choices are either enabled or constrained by structure, right? And it's a reciprocal link, okay? It's this back and forth. Um, you know, what are you experiencing? What is the bigger picture in society experiencing? And how do we change it? That's really a critical question for so many people that are looking at things through a sociological lens. Like, what is the current state of things? And do they need to be that way? Right? And obviously, the answer is no, they don't need to be that way. They are needing to be changed and constantly in so many realms. So, uh, critical thinking is the ability to evaluate claims about truth using reason and evidence. I'm not trying to bore us, but critical thinking is huge. I think that as we return to science, uh, after it's been really attacked over the last several years, we need to get back to critical thinking, not just screaming out, like, fraud, fraud, fraud. Look, I could go out in, in back of my farm and yell, goat, goat, goat. There's not suddenly going to be a goat by me that's like, hey, man, what's up? I'm going to join your farm now. We have to look at these issues critically, and we have to break them down, and we have to use reason and evidence, okay? And oftentimes, we accept things as true just because they're familiar or we feel like they're true. That's conventional wisdom. <clears throat> that's not science. We need to look at poor arguments or recognize when an argument is poor, um, recognize or reject statements that aren't supported by evidence and question our assumptions, right? We are not always right. Um, even though we feel like we may know the answer to whatever. I, I know the answer to everything forever. And then I'm wrong frequently, right? As we all, are. so I have that here. Those people are overrunning the country and taking your jobs, but critical thinking, is really important. If we look at something like um, that, those people are over in this country taking your jobs. Well, so we have one of the largest right meat processing plants in the United States, um, and that's in Greeley, okay? Well, we always in the big picture say those people, what are those people doing? They're crossing our borders. We're gonna have to build walls and fences. These companies, that company, advertises in papers in Mexico and buses people up here 
And then there are arrangements made with law enforcement. And this is not an accident. And all that happens from the company's end. Typically, we look at that person. So in sociology, one of the things that we're doing is really looking at things critically and saying, well, is it really just all about people wanting to overrun this country? So be willing to ask any question, no matter how difficult, think logically as you can, back up your arguments with evidence. I mean, and think about your own assumptions and biases. Do I have biases? It, yes, absolutely. I don't know. Um, I don't like old people who drive. I know. I know, I'm 47. To you, I'm one of those old people driving. I grew up in Chicago though, and it's aggressive. And then I lived in Loveland where like the average age was 80 and everybody wore shades like this that go over your glasses. And not, yes, I, 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 totally, I totally dislike older drivers, but yet so does my dad and he's 80. And my dad's like, yeah, you take away my license when I get to be an old man driver. I'm like, you're 80. Right. So challenge our biases, challenge our assumptions, challenge the things that we think we know. This whole class should be or much of it, you challenging the what you think you need or what you think, you know, and what you really know and the new things that you're learning, all of it. OK, so critical thinking is important. Here we go to the thing that I mentioned last time is the most important thing that I will teach you this semester, and that is cultural pluralism. Being able to see things from another person's perspective, not just your own familiar experiences, right? That's easy, you know? So it's our job as sociologists this semester to cultivate a diverse perspective. And not at all because it's like a PC thing to do, but because the more diverse perspective you cultivate, the more you understand other human beings and the more you can manifest out of this life what you are trying to manifest. It's a pretty important thing. There are a lot of benefits, okay? So we also have to understand that we look at a global perspective. So yes, the individual, but we are interconnected, right? And realizing that we're sort of in this global perspective, we've got to look at that larger world and our society's place in it. I know, I know, I know. The United States is not the only place in the world. <gasps> Shock, what? Are you kidding me? Well, it's hard to know that sometimes when you're in this culture, but the reality is there is <laughs> a whole big world out there. And so one of the ways as sociologists that we know this, right, is two factors, okay? One is being socially marginal. Right, so there's two, if I, this is a test question, two factors that help us gain a sociological perspective in this world, okay? One, being an outsider, being socially marginal, okay? The greater your person's marginality, the better they are able to use the sociological perspective because you're not in it. When you take a step back from something, that's when you're really able to see it. I mean, and that's, again, that perspective is what we're trying to cultivate this semester so that you can do that, right? What do we mean by being socially marginal? In a very basic way, we mean not part in sociology, the terminology, not part of the dominant group, okay? So I encourage you to put yourself in diverse situations, step back from your familiar routines and try and observe things from a culturally pluralistic point of view this semester so that you can sort of increase your experience overall. Right. And then cultivate that sociological perspective that I'm saying is like that challenge thing for us to like look at big picture, small picture, individual behavior, group behavior, society behavior, this country's behavior, this country's behavior. What's that mean for a global population? Woo. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, the rest of it is recorded on Canvas. Absolutely. Um, so before we go today, uh, any questions that you may have? Yes, I will post this um, on the Social 220. It'll be in that playlist. Yes, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe if you want. Otherwise, we'll post it. I will later today in modules. Uh, like I said, I'm alone today for the first time in like 11 months. Both boys are at school, which means I'm, I've got to go pick them up and actually drive in a car. Wow, all these things that I don't do that often. Um, anyway, uh, any questions before I go? I'm going to continue with chapter one this week. Um, if you learn better and you just want to read ahead, you are welcome to read ahead in that process. Anything else?
All right. Be good people and do good things. Uh, reach out to me if you need anything. And I will see you uh, mitvok on Wednesday, everybody. Peace. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care. See you later. Thank you.